Hey, what's up, guys? So, this is now part three of Charles Murray. We're here to find out what his core beliefs are. So that's what we're going to do. Now, this is a long video. I'm not going to do the whole thing. I'm probably going to do this in several sections. But we're going to watch the first few minutes of this. And we're going to see what it looks like. And I'm going to give my honest opinion. And as I said before, whatever my opinions are, I'm going to try to prove it, that my opinions are right. And during that process, when I'm trying to prove that my opinions are right, it's very possible I may end up realizing my opinions are not right. And I'll tell you that too. Alright. Now let's get right on into this. Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today again by Charles Murray, a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, author of many important books, uh, uh, Losing Ground and what was that, 1984, and yes. Bell Curve in the mid-90s, and Coming Apart about four years ago. Really, I, I would say, I'm not sure there's a social commentator who's written. Now, I downloaded a couple samples from two of his books. We're going to take a look at that, too. We're going to look at everything. Everything that's worth looking at, we're going to look at. Even if we determine that he's wrong on a lot of points that he's going to make, even if we determine that, we then have to determine whether he's wrong by intention or or whether he just doesn't know what he's talking about. So that's the other part we're going to find out. Or the, that's the other, that's what we're going to try to find out. That's what we're going to try to do. We're going to try to fully understand everything about this guy. So let's keep right on going. As many important books over the last three decades as Charles, so it's a great pleasure and honor to have you here and you're going to explain the current moment right uh, with that kind of introduction i suppose i'm obligated to <laughs> exactly right so what uh this is the very beginning of august of 2016 uh people are someone wrote something in the new york times yesterday so giving you credit for appreciately seeing that this is the trump or trumpism i guess was going to happen did you see it and what, what do you make of it what, what is how do we understand? well i knew that we were going to have a problem with uh, a white working class and Actually, I guess I'll blow my own horn and say in 1993 for the Wall Street Journal, I had a long article called The Coming of the White Underclass. And if you go back and read that, but, but this is not rocket science. It simply was the trend lines for out-of-wedlock births among working-class whites at that point had been spiking upward. They were at about the level they had been when Pat Moynihan sounded the toxin on black out-of-wedlock births in the early 1960s. And it did not take much foresight to see the same kinds of Social problems were going to attend what was happening to whites. But where we stand now in 2016 is way worse than it was then. How do we get there? Yeah. Well, and explain maybe very briefly what is what is way worse. Well, what indicators would you cite if I said, I don't know, the country seems for, to be in shape. You know, yeah, for for those of you who don't uh, hang out in working class communities or who grew up in one but haven't been back to visit recently, you will probably be shocked. The reason you will be shocked is that a town that you knew 30 years ago, 40 years ago, as a town of uh, intact families and, and no more serious drug problem than some beer and, 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 uh, and marijuana, uh, will now find uh, 
meth use is a huge problem and increasingly heroin use. You will find uh, on the order of 18% uh, of the single white males in that community of working age who are not even looking for work. That's a lot of people. Uh, you will see single parent families all over. You will see children who are not performing well in school, who are uh, delinquent. Basically, Bill, you can take all of the things that social scientists were shaking their heads over about the black inner city in the 1970s and 80s, and all of those things are happening in white working class America now. It's really, it's really, truly, not only unprecedented, but it's of a different nature than the problem of the black inner cities for a very brutal reason. <clears throat> Blacks constitute around 12% of the American population. Uh, Non-Latino whites, depending how you define it exactly, but we're still looking at uh, high 60%, uh, around 70, a little bit lower than that. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's a group that's about four times as large as the black population, and when you get social problems of the magnitude that they now experience, you've got a crisis that dwarfs those of earlier decades. And it really is unlike the problems Italian immigrants had 100 years ago and the Irish. You read about, you know, there were riots and they had drinking problems and so forth. Yeah, and the, the, the reason it's different is that uh, with those uh, Irish and those uh, Italians, you still had communities that functioned in terms of marriage, in terms of the norms for men working, in terms of uh, taking care of your kids. Not that they didn't have problems. Italian communities, Irish communities, and for that matter, Scots-Irish communities, to get to my forebears, uh, were often drank too much and men hit their wives too much, and there were, there were problems. But the communities were functional in, in, in basic ways. So how do we, how do we how get do we to get this here? situation? It's really with the advantage of hindsight, of course. Pretty simple. White working class community. In the book, Coming Apart, I use Fishtown, which was a working class community in Philadelphia, now gentrified. Yeah, I was uh, in Philadelphia, the, the Republican so, Convention, geez. it was uh, a Democratic Convention. Yeah, it is uh, actually completely different gentrified. But the Fishtown was a classic, old, been there since the revolution, working class, white working class communities. Okay, if you were in a Fishtown, or one of the many counterparts throughout the United States, uh, and you were a guy, you probably had a, a, a pretty good manufacturing or other kind of blue collar job. It didn't make you rich. You know, the UAW kind of union jobs really for a pretty small portion of the labor force. But you had a good job. Uh, you put a house over, a roof over your, your family uh, and put food on the table. You had a wife. You had a couple of kids. And all of this did a couple of things. One is it provided the, the family as the unit of organization of the community, which is real important for reasons we can come back to. But also... It gave you a real status in that community. You were one of the good guys. And uh, a guy your age who wasn't supporting his wife, wasn't taking care of his kids, was a bum. He didn't have status, you did. Then you get the 1960s. Uh, you get the pill in the early 1960s, sexual revolution. You get the um, sudden preoccupation of the Democratic Party with blacks in the middle of the 1960s, which continues, then in the late 60s it adds women, and in the 70s, late 70s is already beginning to add gays as the objects of the, the elite liberal affection and concern. And, you know, white working class guys not only are saying, well, what about us? They are actively the objects of scorn of, of the liberal elites. Uh, they are sexist. They are racist, and later they are homophobic. Uh, they are violent. They are guilty of abusing their wives and children. And in all sorts of ways, nobody stops to say, but, you know, most of you guys are still the soul of the earth, you what make America goes. That, there was none of that rhetoric. And there were lots of things that were dislocating. Plus, you got women going into the labor force. So all at once, the economic dependence that women had on men has gone away. And with that, then, you know, well, what happens if I leave? Maybe not so much, because not only is the wife making money, maybe she's making more than you are. So then along comes Reagan, 
and they like Reagan's rhetoric, they like his patriotism. Oh, by the way, a lot of these white working class guys had also been veterans of, of uh, Vietnam. And when they came home, they couldn't wear their uniforms because they wore their uniforms on leave. They were spat on. Okay, so that goes into it. So, so Reagan says, appeals to them. They start voting for the Republicans. That coalition holds together for a while, but things don't get any better. Uh, they, they aren't making more money. Their wages are pretty stagnant. And their communities are starting to break down. That's when you start to have the guys who are still holding down jobs, but you have the other guys who uh, maybe had an accident work, parlayed that into disability, now don't work at all, even though they could. You have guys working enough to qualify for unemployment benefits who then takes the next three or four months off. Uh, you watch around you uh, people of color or women who uh, get big settlements from employers because if they're fired, they fire, they charge a, that they've been harassed or sexually uh, or uh, racistly uh, fired. So they are really, if you'll pardon the technical term, pissed off uh, by 2016, and who can blame them? You have in this, though, two very different components, and I'll wrap up this here. You still have... You still have working class guys who are playing by the rules, who are getting married, taking care of their kids, working hard. I mean, we live in a part of the country where we know people. <laughs> we actually we actually hang out with a lot of people of the kind I'm talking about. And there are a whole lot of people who are doing the right things. There are also a whole lot of people who fit the other description I gave. Problem is they're in the same communities. So it's not as if the guys who are playing by the rules still live in functional communities. It's not only the, ba the bad guys who don't. The, the whole thing is festering. Was it inevitable that the, I think, a good faith effort, presumably by, let's leave the liberal side, by, by Clinton on the Democratic side, by Reagan and then Bush on the Republican side, all of whom thought they were speaking to these people, and I think probably honestly thought they had policies that would help them. Is it just overwhelmed by globalization and sort of social forces beyond politics, or was this could could it have been very different? Well, there are certain things you weren't going to change no matter what. You weren't going to change a sexual revolution. And let's not put the blame on uh, feminism and women going out and becoming economically more independent. Guys also discovered because of the sexual revolution that they could get regular sexual access to a woman without marrying her. And uh, that's a big deal if you're 22 years old or 18 years old. Even bigger deal later in life. But the, the point is that the rules had... What is his obsession with people getting married? I heard him talk about that over and over and over again. What's that got to do with anything? Does he think it's immoral for people to be together and not be married or something? Is that what's going on here? I don't, I'm just thinking out. I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. Like, what is he saying? He seems awfully concerned about whether people are married or not. If you really want to cut down on divorce rates, the people need to wait longer before they get married. It's as simple as that. And it sounds like he's saying that that's why certain families are dysfunctional because the, the parents aren't married. Are you kidding me? Is that what he's saying? Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not asking. I'm just asking. Is that what he's saying? Is that really what he's saying? Two people could care for a child just as well as two other people who are married.
Let's keep going. Let's see. I'm starting to get a little annoyed. Because he's not really coming out and saying it. He's not explaining his his belief system very well right now. But let's keep going. Changed in ways that no politics were going to change, no matter what. But when it comes to the globalization, uh, let me not speak to the left. Let me speak to the right here. Yeah. And uh, a few mea culpas for people like you and me. Maybe it's not fair with you because I don't know where, exactly where he stood in, on immigration. But I was a big fan of globalization. And when I would... Uh, read uh, liberal uh, accusations about Nike's sweatshops in Vietnam. Well, I spent time in Southeast Asia, and I know very well that what they're calling sweatshops, in most cases, are the best jobs <laughs> these people have ever had. And not only the best jobs they've ever had, offer the best chance for advancement, um, offer wages that, uh, that, that are really quite good uh, for, the, for the cost of living in those places. Best and chance so, for their kids. Best chance for the kids. So I was, I was very benign about mobilization, about mobilization. And I didn't pay... Did they just say best chance for the kids? Isn't uh, the Nike thing, wasn't the accusation that they were, they had children working in sweatshops? Isn't that the ac accusation? Well, let's keep going. I don't want to jump to any conclusions just yet, because we haven't got very far into this thing. So I'm going to give it a few more minutes. And then the first part of this is going to be concluded, but I'd like to get some concrete information out of this first part. I think if I was there, I'd throw the shoot at him already. Attention to what large-scale immigration meant in the United States. I read uh, the economists, and you know of many of them, who say, when you look at it from a macroeconomic point of view, uh, the immigrants are a plus-plus. They are not displacing Americans from jobs, etc. You, you, you're familiar with that right. literature. <clears throat> I am willing to believe on a macro sense they may be right. It is also true on a micro sense there have also been many cases of guys who are making a decent wage as roofers and now can't make a decent wage as roofers because illegal immigrants are being hired by roofing companies at well below the rates, uh, including payroll taxes that have to be paid. That does happen too. And just because it does not, it's not a big problem when you take it in terms of a nice econometric analysis using uh, the current population survey, that doesn't mean it isn't a real problem in communities. Another thing that's going on here is the, the social science topic perhaps that uh, we least like to talk about. And that is the effect of ethnic heterogeneity on social trust. The what? It was Bob Putnam of Bowling Alone fame who brought this to public attention in a lecture he gave uh, around 2006. What he found and what others had already found, he was bringing to public attention something that had been percolating in, in academia is that even after controlling for socioeconomic status, ethnic heterogeneity destroys social trust. Social trust is really important. Francis Fukuyama wrote a whole book about the importance of social trust for, for societies to function. But at the local level, it is absolutely crucial for, for the American civic culture to work. And it's not just that ethnic heterogeneity 
reduces social trust. It also reduces the trust within trust within ethnicities. Hmm. So white people in that community don't trust as much uh, each other as much as they used to. They hunker down, in Bob Putnam's phrase. Well, all this immigration, how did it affect you and me? Sorry to keep putting you in this situation. It provided opportunities for cheap gardeners and cheap nannies. Right. We do not live in communities. Well, actually, I do. But you don't live in a community in which right. you have a large uh, Hispanic uh, influx. And, and people who live in elite communities uh, uh, may have a lot of Asians moving in. But nobody worries about Asians because Asians... He sure is jumping from topic to topic now, isn't he? And he's barely explaining any one I don't know what to think about this guy. Have higher rates of school completion and intact families and everything than, than any other group has. So the people who bore the brunt of the social trust lost by increasing immigration was the working class. That was a big price. Yeah, on immigration, I was sort of liberal in the mid middle of the last decade. I sort of vaguely supported the Bush-McCain attempts to have a big immigration reform. But I was against the 2013 Gang of Apes. I had become convinced that the costs, both of illegal and I'd say legal, big legal immigration, were pretty great, the social costs. Yes, you said whatever the net net you know, uh -huh. economic things. On the other hand, would it make much difference? And that's what I guess I come back to. The flip side of it is, I mean, if you passed a dream conservative immigration, you know, policy tomorrow, we built the wall, no, no illegals, and fewer illegals or illegals would only come when they really were no Americans to do the job or however you'd want to, you know, structure uh -huh. that immigration policy. I mean, is it symbolic as much, or is it real in terms of its effect? Okay, let's specify what we're talking about, because I think we're talking about the same thing. Because I would be in favor of this. Uh, control the borders, and if that takes a wall, then so be it. Right. Uh, but use whatever measures are needed to control it. Uh, then reduce the number of people who may legally immigrate here with low skills. Follow the Canadian model, follow other models which say, essentially, immigration is to be to the benefit of the United States of America. And if this makes us uh, not want to read the base of the Statue of Liberty, uh, so be it. The base of the Statue of Liberty about huddled masses was not part of the Constitution. Right. It is not a founding document. Right. And, it's a policy that was uh, yeah. worked for America in the late 19th century. <laughs> That's right. Which incidentally was changed. Yeah. It was not the policy of America from well, 1924 to 1965. Some would say it pretty well. The, the point being this, that, uh, that we just simply shift our attitude and say, we are going to look out for Americans first. And we're especially going to look out for working class Americans. Now, having said that, let's suppose that we, we manage to achieve all that. Will it then be the case that you have all these guys go out and take these jobs that may pay 15 or $17 an hour, but involves doing agricultural labor? It's hard for me to see that happening, right. because even right now, the stories are rife of the jobs that American won't take. These are not made up. If you go to any employer uh, of low-skilled labor or even medium-skilled labor, they will tell you horror stories about trying to keep their payrolls filled with the kinds of skilled people they know. And they will also tell you horror stories about they hire a guy. And let's remind people who may have turned in late, we aren't talking about... Latinos or blacks in the inner city. We're talking about white bread, American, non-Latino males who take a job and uh, they can't show up on time. They take half hour toilet breaks frequently. Uh, they don't do a very good job when they actually do work. And eventually they're fired. And when they're fired, they are filled with indignation that the employer would throw them out when they were you know, just they're doing a good job. It's not just that they don't work well. They, 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 there seems to be a kind of inability to take responsibility for the fact that they failed. And this is very common. So would it make it any better if we had that kind of immigration policy? I think so, but I think it would be at the margin. And I think that it would take something more dramatic than that 
to restore anything like the work ethic and the cultural expectations that we had 50 years ago. I take it you would say the same thing about trade. I mean, Trump has made a big deal of trade policy, and it's resonated more than I would have expected. It's not been historically a winning issue in America. The protectionist attempts, uh, rhetoric of way back, uh, Gephardt and Buchanan, and a lot of people in both parties have tried it and never quite succeeded. There's always been some sentiment that way. I, I think I underestimated. The, I'm just talking to people out on the you know campaign trail a little bit, reporters and stuff. The trade lines in the speech get huge applause. I mean, I don't know that it's empirically true that it makes much difference. And again, it's very hard to imagine a world in 2016 where we're putting up much in the way of trade barriers, honestly. This is where I'm going to stand at the barricade, uh, because I'm, I'm willing to say I'm with the idea of restricting low-skill immigration, severely restricting it. I think that if there is one economic principle that Every economist I know who I respect says trade is a win-win, uh, that, uh, that if we restrict trade, the quality of living in the United States is going to go down, not just for people at the top, it's going to go way down for people uh, uh, who shop at Walmarts and, and are really need to get an inexpensive product. And I would say, I mean, I don't, you've made this point, I think, also that also, the, the, the effect of trade in helping hundreds of millions, I guess billions by now, of very poor people around the world is not trivial. Uh, in India and China, the, that those, their success depends on a more or less free trading or open trading and open capital uh, regime worldwide. And, and that's not an insignificant moral accomplishment to help those people lift themselves out of poverty. Conversely, it would not be an insignificant moral problem, I would say. I, I guess that I have shifted enough. I, I agree, by the way, with everything you said about the moral uh, uh, value of what we have done. I would be more sympathetic to say, yeah, but I'd like to make sure we're okay in this country with our workers, our low-income people, if I thought trade modifications would do that. Yeah. And and I am not convinced of that. I, th I think um, Adam Smith in Wealth of Nations laid out the case for open trade. I don't know of any effective refutation of that yeah. by anybody. I don't know of any serious economist who, who doesn't see that as pretty much as valid now as it was in 1776. Yeah, so that's interesting that you would distinguish immigration and trade. As yeah. Those issues are often lumped together, and I mean, Trump himself does, and, and on the counter Trump side, people lump them together as kind of examples of responsibility. I think it's an empirical matter. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's way easier to demonstrate that there are no significant harms that free trade does to low-income American workers, whereas the attempts to demonstrate that large immigration doesn't hurt low scale is a lot dicier. And the cultural effects of large-scale immigration are the way cultural effects too. of shirts being made in China are presumably yeah, exactly not very right. great, whereas the cultural effects of people not speaking the language and tensions between communities and stuff are now. Okay. I'm curious, what do you think about this? I've been struck by this. People say working class, and you've been sort of focusing on, at least in the book, you focus on, a, I think, what we would consider kind of classic working class, you know, assembly line, people working mostly with their bodies, so to speak. But I'm struck, well, just also, I live in Fairfax County, which is an upscale county, but like most areas of the U.S., it's mixed, and there are area parts of it that have uh, quite a lot of immigrants, actually, and aren't very well off. And so if you go to some of the, you know, there are 23 high schools in Fairfax County. Well, that's going to do it for this video. Didn't really learn much, now did we? Now, in closing, what I'm going to say, maybe I've missed some important information in this. Y'all put it in the comments. Y'all see something maybe I didn't see? Put it in there, because I know some of this stuff I didn't understand. That's okay. So if I miss something, let me know.
We will probably finish this video at some point. You know, you guys can request it. If if I don't get to back to this quick enough, put it in there. Let me know you want this to finish. You want me to finish watching this. Or maybe you guys can finish watching it and then you can tell me if there's something else here that's going to help that's going to help me figure out what his core beliefs are. We've not really got there yet. So I'm a little annoyed about this. It's taken him so long to just come out and say it. I'm always expecting to hear something from him, and I don't hear what I'm expecting to hear. Maybe that's by design. I don't know yet. We're going to find out. Like I keep saying, we're going to find out. All right, y'all. I'm going.